Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Rich from NC State, and I'm going to introduce the speakers for today's panel session on extreme value analysis. Uh, so there is going to be a working group on extreme value analysis, at least that's the temporary plan. So the goal of this panel session is to identify some hot topics in extreme value analysis that might make for good working group projects down the line. So uh, keep in mind that as you're asking questions and so forth. Uh, the way the panel is going to go, uh, each of the four speakers has prepared a few minutes introduction of themselves, some of their research, and potentially some topics that we could discuss. So after going through their introductions, then we'll open the, the uh, questioning up for the crowds. All right, so the four speakers, let me give a very brief introduction, and then they'll introduce themselves in more detail. Uh, on the left, we have Michael Weiner from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Next to him is Dan Cooley, who is in the Statistics Department at Colorado State. Uh, next is Adam Monahan, who's an atmospheric scientist from the University of Victoria. And then on the end is Michael Stein from the University of Chicago. Uh, so the first introduction is going to be from Michael. Thank you. So I was going to talk about event attribution, but I said everything I wanted to say on Monday. So <laughs> keep that in the back of your mind. So I had to think of something else. And um, uh, Dan and I have worked about multivariate extremes. And I think this is a really interesting and important subject. But first, of course, my standard disclaimer, this is just me speaking, not the government. Um, so most extreme events are multivariate in some sense, but not every relevant variable is extreme in isolation itself. And so the t example I like to say, talk about is hot, dry, and windy versus hot, moist, and stagnant. These are very different events. The meteorology is very different. The impacts are very different. Uh, hot, dry, and windy tend to be forest fires. Hot, moist, and stagnant tend to be people dying. Um, and so there's no reason to expect that the mechanisms of change are the same, the meteorology is not the same. So why would the statistics be the same? And so I think it's important to consider this aspect of extreme events. Um, for instance, there were two unrelated but deadly heat waves separated by only five weeks in India and Pakistan in 2015. India, which is um, this one here, this is relative humidity on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. Um, the events in the heat wave are the black dots here, a couple of them here. Um, and then the colors are the, are the climatology at this weather station in Hyderabad. Um, this event is the one that happened first it was uh, the delayed onset of the monsoon. And so that was why it, it's, dry, it's drier there anyway, but it was hot and dry. And you can see that these temperatures, I hope you can see these black dots tend to be very hot and but relatively dry. In fact, I think this one is the hottest day of this. And so not quite unprecedented, but hot and, um, and uh, deadly. Karachi, on the other hand, was a, um, a much deadlier event, actually. Um, and uh, um, it was, it's much more humid there, it's on the coast, but the event itself, the, 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 the points are, are, are in, you know, not nearly as hot relative to the climatology. But as a combination, uh, some of these events, some of these days, these are the, the daily maximum heat index, um, were, um, were unprecedented. And so the combination was, was rare. So what what the colors represent are um, rather um, artificial um, advisory levels that NOAA publishes for the heat index, which is a bicubic function of, uh, of temperature and relative humidity, which obviously are not very relevant. Uh, I think it's caution, extreme caution, danger, and then the purple points are extreme danger. Um, and you know they're not very relevant when the average is red in these places. It may work in parts of the United States for certain people, but it certainly doesn't work here. Now, so, so what I wanted you to look at is, these sort of, imagine there's a line drawn down. There was a recent paper by Mora et al. in Nature Climate Change where they looked at all the deadly heat waves that they could find that had high quality weather data and mortality data, and they used a support vector machine to um, to make a draw another kind of curve, that's what these blue curves are. The, the black dots are ones where people died, and um, and this curve looks a lot different than the heat index curve. It's a lot steeper, for instance. Um, you know, the difference between 50% humidity and 80% humidity for a given temperature is more or less the same. 
They also looked at other variables. This is what you haven't seen, Dan. Um, this is relative humidity versus other, other, um, other variables, so wind speed. So these deadly events tend to be when the wind was low or the daily minimum temperature. They tended to be hot nights. That makes some sense, too. And they also, during the day, they were, they were very sunny. So, um, uh, you know, it really is this, 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 this relationship between human health and, and heat waves is really, truly a multivariate problem. So thank you. We wait for questions until after all four speakers. Uh, that was a great lead in. Uh, the next session is on climate and health, so keep those talks and those slides in mind when we get to that session. Uh, anyways, our next speaker is Dan Cooley. Uh, Dan is going to be the leader of the Extremes Working Group. Yeah, so uh, it's really fun to work with with people like like Michael on the on the climate side of things. Of course, I'm in a statistics department, so I start with a pile of data and then try to make sense of it. And um, so I work in extremes, and and kind of the the mantra of extremes. Many of you are probably familiar with it, but the idea is let the tale speak for itself. And so we start off with this very large pile of data. We take a very small subset of that data, which we consider to be extreme, and then fit tools, just fit uh, models just to that small subset of data, which we think helps explain the extreme behavior. And, and essentially, we discard all the data, which talks about the, the sort of day-to-day -day stuff, which doesn't influence extreme. So um, the atmospheric community is actually quite aware of extremes methods. And, and I think that's due to a lot of people who've worked uh, very heavily to very hard to, to get the atmospheric community, science community aware of it, people like Francis Weirs and Rick Katz and, and many others who um, have talked to communities and talked about GEV distributions and generalized Pareto distributions and things like that. Um, and the, 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 the extremes community is, or the atmospheric sciences community is familiar with ideas like return levels or, or annual exceedance probabilities and, and the way we express very rare events. <clears throat> Most of that knowledge is in the univariate case, and that's and univariate extremes are, are very well developed. Um, I think the methods are, are pretty pretty solid. Where a lot of work is being done is in multivariate extremes, and so Michael's uh, intro slides very very nicely uh, previewed mine. My my area of research is in multivariate extremes. That basic mantra of let the tail speak for itself is still true. What we want to do is we want to take this pile of, say, bivariate data and, and, extreme, and, and describe what's going on uh, with just the extreme behavior, and so that we have to describe tail dependence or, or extreme dependence. Um, and so just like we use when we're doing the univariate case and we say, well, you want to use a generalized extreme value model because it has asymptotic justification. It's the right model to use if you're modeling annual maxima. <laughs> There, there are right and wrong ways to uh, look at extremal dependence. And so this is, uh, uh, let me just try and, and very briefly illustrate that for you. These are two data sets. The right one is actually the same data set that, that Michael was looking at. That's the Karachi data. Um, the left one is data from a weather station in California looking at the Santa Ana effect. So we're looking at uh, wind speed on, on the x-axis. We got dryness on, on the y-axis. Big fires can happen when wind is high and, and the atmosphere, essentially dryness is, is negated humidity. So um, big fires can happen when those two things are large. And, and the, the points labeled C and W, C is the cedar fire, which is a, a very large uh, Santa Ana induced fire. Uh, the W is the witch fire, which is also a very large Santa, Andu Santa Ana induced fire. Um, and what we see from this data, if we want to look at the, 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 the nature of the tail dependence, we see that wind speed and dryness can occur at the same time. Very extreme uh, values of those two variates can occur at the same time. We've got lots of points up here which are among the largest for wind speed and among the largest for dryness. And so that's a fundal, fundamental type of dependence that we want to capture 
when we're talking about extremes. And this is something that we term asymptotic dependence. And if you go to your list, your, your catalog of multivariate statistical models, very few models have that characteristic. And so we need extreme specific models to try and capture phenomenon like that. Now the, the data that Michael described, which is this, this uh, human health effect where we've got temperature on the x-axis and relative humidity on the, on the y-axis, is very different. When you get, you, you get your highest temperatures when it's dry because moisture in the air tends to mitigate temperature. Um, the points are a subset of the points that, that Michael showed, but, but those, those are a week during that Pakistani heat wave that, that killed thousands of people. Um, and what we see are those are points where temperature is very high and, and uh, temperature is quite high, but not at its highest levels on record. Relative humidity is pretty high, and there was just this sweet spot of this combination. Now, unfortunately, the fundamental dependence structure of that data is different than this because you don't get your high instances at the same time. And this is a case of asymptotic independence. And so we have to have statistical models that capture this. So the takeaway message uh, is the same. We still want the tail to speak for itself. We still want to use models that make sense for the tail. But as you get into just bivariate case, that can get a lot more complicated. Um, so. And in, in the extremes land, uh, two is high dimensional. Um, we occasionally get, realistically, um, even, even 50 is high, is, 50 is really high dimensional for extremes. Some of the things that we've been looking at are uh, principal component analyses type, uh, type of um, decompositions that make sense through this dependence framework for extremes. So start talking about dependence through the extremes framework and then talk about decomposing that somehow. And these are just a, a, some, some pictures of a couple of the, essentially the eigenvectors of this extreme decomposition. And we could do things like is uh, typically done in atmospheric science where you look at the coefficients of them and then you try to look for relevant patterns. Um, but I, and this, this, I know in a conference like this or a workshop like this, this looks sort of like a toy example, but, but I'm pretty darn proud of this. This is actually sort of cutting edge stuff. Um, so the, a, obviously there's a lot of work that needs to be done in extremes. And, and I just want to conclude with sort of a list which essentially corresponds with, with what's out there on the, on the board. Detection and attribution methods for extremes need to be looked at. And, and there was some discussion about uh, detection and attribu or attribution specifically in the FAR and, and uh, uncertainty associated with that. For very extreme events, there's a, an awful lot of uncertainty. And, and I guess I would fall in the camp of let's do it as best we can. Let's acknowledge where those uncertainties lie. And, um, and, and but, but we really need to do the work because uh, we had a, 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 um, a uh, panel meeting at, at JSM just a few weeks ago, and, and the, one of our panelists actually works for Netflix now, but he, he made a, a really interesting point. If we don't do the attribution stuff, somebody else is gonna, and we know a lot better how to do this. So I think that uh, we need to do, we need to work very hard to, to um, talk about these things intelligently. We need models that capture persistence. One of the things that's not shown very well in that figure on the right is, well, those six days that I've plotted occurred in sequence. And of course, that's why people died. It wasn't because they had one hot and humid day. It's because they had a number of these in succession. And extremes models in general don't, we, what we do very, very well is we capture the spikes, the 100-year floods and things like that. We don't capture things like heat waves or droughts very well where there's a persistence. And so these are statistical questions that we need to do a better job of. Understanding dependence in high dimensions, I, my other slide already talked to that. But an, an idea that, that um, really should be guiding us is, is this idea of extremes and, and processes or dynamics. And this, this talks to some of the uh, ideas that um, were raised earlier in the, in the morning session. Andrew asked about, you know, well, how, do, how does your deep learning technique inform me about the, the physics? And you could say the same thing about extremes techniques. In the extremes world, 
we're getting pretty good at describing the extremes phenomena. Well, you know, here's my estimate of what the 100-year flood is. It's descriptive. But we don't tie extremes statistics to the physics at all. And in fact, doing so is really, really challenging because if we're going to do this, imagine go ba going back to my extremes mantra, you take this big pile of data, you extract this subset of extremes and try to describe what's going on. Well, when you've extracted that subset, you've lost all the physics. So getting the physics to tie with the statistics is a real challenge. Um, so I think there's kind of a disconnect between the questions that climate scientists want answered and the questions that we in the extreme statistics community can answer. And hopefully we can work on that. Uh, next is, oh, um, oh, Adam Monahan is next. So I don't work on extremes in any traditional sense. Uh, much of my work has to do with trying to develop uh, data-informed, idealized physical models of the probability distribution of quantities within the atmosphere and, to some extent, within the ocean. And so my presentation here is going to be a little bit uh, unorthodox in that regard, but I'm going to advocate uh, for the use of physically-based idealized models to try to develop a more physical understanding of perhaps not the very, very far end of the tails of distributions, but of certainly the tails of distributions. And I'll illustrate this with just a single example, and it's one associated with work that I did several years ago, and it's, I'll use this as an example because it's one that I know particularly well, but I could have drawn from other examples in other questions of understanding physically in an idealized sense the distributions of um, atmospheric quantities. So what I've shown here on the um, left-hand panels are maps of the mean standard deviation and skewness fields of the zonal wind over the ocean. Now, the zonal wind component is the component of the flow that comes from the west towards the east if we have positive values, from the east towards the west if we have negative values. Looking at this distribution of the mean zonal component, we see we have mid-latitude westerlies and tropical easterlies. This map would not surprise a 17th century mariner. Looking at the distribution of standard deviations, we see we have a much more variability in the extra tropics, in the storm tracks, relatively quiet uh, within the tropics. Again, not terribly surprising. But if we look at the skewness distribution, so the, the deviation of the PDF from being symmetric around its mean, we see that the skewness values take relatively large values up to two and close to minus two, depending where we are, and they're, they're geographically organized so that we tend to have positive skewness in the tropics in the region where the means are negative and negative skewness in the extra tropics where the means tend to be positive. And in fact, if you stare at these maps long enough, you'll see that they're spatially anti-correlated. And if you just do a scatter plot of the mean versus the skewness and then just try to estimate the density using a kernel smoother, you see that there's a very high degree of organization between these two fields. Now, there's no a priori reason why a quantity like the component, which is not unlike speed bounded below by zero, this is a value, a variable that can take uh, values from minus infinity to infinity, there's no a priori reason why it should be related to the skewness. And so what this is telling us is something about the physics of the system. And so you can use this information, having recognized these kinds of relationships, you can use that to inform the development of physically based models that might actually try to capture this behavior. And so what I've shown here in the bottom panel is similarly a plot of the mean zonal wind speed versus the skewness from an idealized stochastic differential equation, an ordinary differential equation, just two variables, and you'll see that it can capture much of the behavior that we see in the observations. And the model itself is basically based on coming up with an idealized representation of the momentum budget point-wise within the uh, boundary layer over the ocean. So we have time tendencies of the zonal and meridional components. The meridional component is the north-south component. And we can break down these rates of change into their physical contributions using our understanding of the forces at work within the atmosphere. We have terms here which I've called pi, and at the end, my uh, sigma w dots. These represent the mean and variations in the large-scale weather, shall we say. So these are, can be understood as an imbalance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. 
This is in the mean, and these are the variations. So this is just variations. If you want, this is climate. And then we have surface drag, so the turbulent flux of momentum from the atmosphere into the underlying ocean, which is a nonlinear function of the flow itself. And an idealized model like this, which is a highly simplified representation of the momentum budget of the boundary layer, but still one that is based on a clear and systematic set of approximations from the full set of equations that would characterize the momentum budget, this stochastic differential equation, although its individual trajectories do not admit analytic solution, you can solve for the stationary distribution associated with this and come up with a physically based model for the joint distribution of the two components of the wind or integrating over wind direction for a physically based model of the probability distribution of the speeds where the parameters that enter this distribution have clear physical meaning and are in principle measurable. And so this is the kind of approach that can be taken. It is highly idealized. No one is going to claim that this is a good model to make predictions about the evolution of the winds over the ocean. But it is based on the same physical principles, if represented in a highly idealized fashion, which then allows us to develop a physical intuition for the kinds of um, shapes we see in our probability distributions of atmospheric variables. And I could point towards other examples of sea surface temperature and uh, atmospheric temperature over the ocean, of precipitation, where similar types of approaches give um, insight, physically based insight, into the distribution of these quantities. And I would argue, even though it's in a highly idealized setting, is a, an approach to this reconciliation of the statistics and the physics that has been a theme of the last few days of discussion. Thanks. But, and the last panelist is Michael Stein. I'm not gonna tell you anything about some, anything I'm actually working on. I just wanna talk about some issues. So, so the extremes literature is driven to a large extent by asymptotic theory that has proven very useful and is essential to thinking about extremes, but I sometimes wonder that mathematics can be a little bit of a trap. And so, so, so I want to kind of think about, about um, ways in which that might be the case and how that could lead to research problems about extremes in general, but also extremes in climate. So, so there's this notion of throwing out most of the data and then fitting a model to the tail. And there's something about that that, that already I don't like. Um, because so at least in the simple versions of what's done is you're literally saying all the data below this level is useless and all the data above this level follows exactly some parametric model like a generalized Pareto distribution. And that has to be, at the least, inefficient statistically to have this sharp cutoff between data that's useless and data that's completely, in, that's completely informed by a simple parametric model. But the, the arguments are only asymptotic. The argument isn't, the asymptotic argument isn't that a generalized Pareto distribution is exactly correct above some threshold. It's that it becomes more and more correct if the original distribution is what's called regularly varying as you move farther and farther out the tail. And, and so there seems to be a little bit of a, uh, it's not that people don't think about this and have ways of trying to do better, but at least in its simple versions, it seems to me there's, there's, there's a little bit of a problem there. Um, so, so in particular, it seems to me that, that uh, especially if one wants to push moving far out into the tails, and maybe the answer is just don't do it, that, that uh, uncertainties you get from standard methods are probably too small because they act as if the, they take the asymptotics more seriously than I believe they should be taken, uh, or in some ways less seriously, but, but we can maybe go on in the discussion. So, so what are way, possible ways to fix this? Well, one way is to use methods that don't involve picking a specific cutoff, and I'm trying to work with Brian and the student to think about that. Seems to me another approach is to try to, you know, so. So even for someone who, who I don't think of myself as a Bayesian, I don't even think that's an interesting question to decide whether I'm a Bayesian or not. You know, it does seem like if you have a lot of uncertainties, then in principle the right way to deal with it is to be a Bayesian if you could figure out how to do that for any particular problem. So how would you be a good Bayesian for, for this kind of problem? Well, you'd, you'd want to say something. So there's a whole field of doing non-parametric density estimation by various Bayesian approaches. 
but, but we need something more than that here. We need something that says, well, we at least think the tails have some kind of nice behavior to that. So how do we come up with good priors that say, we think the tails are somewhat well behaved, but we're not sh we don't think they're exactly like these simple models beyond any cutoff. Is there a good way of developing a some kind of Bayesian non-parametric approach that would take account of that? I've been trying to think about that. All right, so, so definitely, you know, for climate data, we want to think about more than marginal distributions. We want to think about processes, and, and, and as has already been discussed. And once you start modeling processes, it seems to me even more problematic to throw out most of the data, because, because you want to think about, just even as a time series, you want to think about what's the chances of going from a not extreme day to an extreme day, or back, back and forth, right? So it seems to me, once we start talking about processes, and then if we go to space-time processes, I feel even more I want to model the process and not just the extremes. And so, but the question is, how do you do that in a way so that you don't kid yourself, right? Why do people want to use extreme methods? They don't want the fact that their model could be even slightly misspecified, and then because most of your data is not extreme, therefore get biased estimates of the extremes because of that. So is there some way of coming up with, with models for the whole process that are flexible enough that we don't kid ourselves about what we know about the extremes? Um, okay, so a couple of specific comments that, that, that relate to climate that, that one could take advantage of is it seems to me one of the better uses of climate model output is to ask what if questions about, about how, do, how do certain methods work. And so, so how do you test a statistical method? Well, you either prove a theorem or you look at a data set or you come up with some simple stochastic model that you simulate under. But none of those things really get, get at, it seems to me, how are, how are statistical methods for extremes going to really work on real climate data? The reason we can't do it with observational data is we don't have enough of it, right? I mean, you know, mo uh, climate records just don't go back that far in general. But climate model output, in principle, we can generate, you know, thousands and thousands of years of it. And so we can really use it as our, as our simulator. That is, instead of simulating under our AR Gaussian model, we use our climate model output as our simulator. Now we can ask, you know, how well do extreme methods work? So if I only have one simulation of the future climate and I try to estimate the extremes, well, I can compare to what I get if I have 100 simulations of the climate, right? And then that, that gives me a way of seeing how well my methods work. Um, and another thing that I think is really important for us to look at is that the world we live in and will be living in for quite a long time is a transient climate, right, that's constantly changing. So how do we estimate extremes well when the extremes are constantly changing, perhaps not in simple ways? So I think that's another big thing that we could uh, maybe talk about this year. Uh, and uh, just to maybe, uh, you know, follow up on, on, on physical, physical stories that we can put behind extremes, it seems to me that for some some quantities in the climate, we could try to come up with arguments like what's, what's a maximum temperature? Because you can kind of almost create a worst case scenario based on, well, the sun, you know, the skies can only be so clear, the sun only puts out so much energy, the air can only heat too much before it rises, right? There are kind of physical constraints that you can try to think about for putting uh, uh, up. So the thing that's interesting about extremes, if you saw Dan's plots, I think, or I don't know, one of you showed plots of, uh, somebody showed plots of, shape parameters of climate distributions. For precipitation, the shape parameters are mostly positive, and for temperature, they're mostly negative. And if you take the negative value seriously, they mean temperature has an upper bound to it. And you can actually try to think about whether those estimated upper bounds make sense physically, because, yeah, all right. So, so that would be one way we could maybe bring some kind of marriage between statistical models and physical models for extremes. Thanks, that was great. Uh, so the remaining 20, maybe 25 minutes or so, we have open for questions. Uh, this is being recorded, so make sure when you ask a question, you've got a microphone in front of you when you ask the question. Uh, Doug? So this is a, this is a response to, to, to Michael. Um, I, uh, oh, oh, oh yeah, that's right. Um, Michael, one and, one and Michael number two. <laughs> um, so I, I, I completely agree with you that the, um, the, the distribution is sort of a single quantity, and, and there's something called the tail. And um, it's, um, 
it's always tricky to decide ex exactly where that tail begins and ends, and, and maybe there should be methods that just fit the whole distribution but are smart about the tail. One thing, um, and, and I'm going to sort of channel Grace Waba a, a bit about this, um, if, you're, if you're a spline person and, and if you're thinking about um, bu building in parametric constraints that are sort of come in in sort of a, a weak kind of way, um, you, you would simply put that in, in the null space of the spline. And so the, the idea here is um, if, if you're really going after um, Pareto tails, you would, you would have a spline which tends to relax to that but doesn't become exactly equal to that at, at any particular point. And of course, the, the rest of it, the spline would be doing the, the non-parametric. Yeah, no, I think certainly that's a, one of the viable approaches for yeah. trying to get away from yeah. saying that we want to constrain things somewhat, but we don't want to force them to be in some kind of yeah. So, uh, yeah. Obviously, there's there's relationships between right. In the back. I'm only kind of passingly familiar with imprecise probabilities or robust Bayesian methods, but I wonder to what degree there's a literature on um, applications of that to extremes. That is to allow for sets of probability densities rather than precise densities, um, and maybe where that imprecision is more um, is wider in, in the tails because we have few, by definition fewer data out there. Anybody in the panel able to comment on that? Uh, I'm looking to my right because because Br Brian's the most Bayesian person on the stage. Um, take that as a compliment. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> uh, so I'm not as familiar with robust Bayesian methods that you described, but non-parametric Bayesian methods like Dirichlet process, polio trees, these kinds of things, I think at least try to get to that. Uh, and I think Bayesian non-parametrics uh, also have the property, as Doug was mentioning, with splines that you can start with a your prior guess is what the density looks like and somehow place a prior on it so that if it agrees well, then it's the prior quickly or the posterior quickly adheres to that and if not, it's robust to that. Uh, but one thing that, so I've thought about this several times and uh, one thing just taking these uh, Bayesian nonparametrics and applying them directly is that there's usually just one measure of how strong the prior is. There's not a separate measure for how strong the prior is in the middle of the distribution versus the tails of the distribution. So it seems like you need some sort of a generalization of that to work for extreme value. And just a, a more general comment. I think that Bayesian methods for extremes are surprisingly unexplored. Uh, there's a lot of Bayesian work on sort of building spatial hierarchical models. But uh, just basic Bayesian work uh, is, is not well explored. And part of that is just because it's hard to elicit prior, useful prior information about the parameters of an extreme value distribution. Um, and then another aspect which, which Michael talked about is, is this sort of blending of models across thresholds or, or combining flexible models below and, and, um, and, and uh, some sort of parametric model above, and, and that, of course, can be done uh, nicely in a Bayesian way, which would account for all uncertainties. So, I mean, Bayesians don't throw out data, right? <laughs> they, may, they may try to come up with a model that, so that data over here doesn't influence too much what's going on over there. But. I think Bayesians could throw out data. <laughs> I don't think throwing well, out data is a good whatever they want. But, 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 we can definitely do whatever we but, want, including throw out data, the, yeah. The Bayesian <laughs> philosophy would say, you know, well, you set up your model right, it should automatically downweight the things that aren't informative, right? But, but why would you throw out information if you don't have to? Well, I agree with that, but I guess the idea is you wouldn't be throwing out information that's valuable to estimate what you want to estimate, which would be the same. And, and just for those of you who are unfamiliar with, with this area, I mean, it, it, it sounds very strange to say, throw away your data. Um, and. The reason people in classical traditional extremes do this is because that data, which you have so much of, if you want to fit one model to the entire distribution, you have all of this data 
in the bulk of the data screaming, here's what my parameter estimate should be. And you've got this tiny little subset of data up here in the tail saying, here's how the tail reacts. And the, the, the fit of your distribution gets overwhelmed by this day-to-day -day sort of stuff. And so that's the motivation, a, a heuristic explanation for the motivation of why we do this in the first place. And it really is a tricky decision to make. Can I add to that? Um, this is important in a climate change uh, context in something like precipitation. The mechanisms of change for the average precipitation are dictated by uh, uh, changes in circulation and, 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 and uh, energy budget considerations. But in the tail, it's, it's largely due to cloud space clapron scaling. And so you can have, there are plenty of places in the projections where the averages decrease and the, the tails increase. And so you know, that's going to make things even more complicated if you try to use everything. Can I just interject a very quick comment, since I do have the microphone in my hand? Um, the, um, the, the issue with Bayesian non-parametrics is the same as the issue with non-Bayesian non-parametrics, namely that all of these extreme val value methods, ultimately, you do really genuinely want to use them to extrapolate. And nobody's ever come up with a method of doing that that's purely non-parametric. So I, I think that was that's a comment that needs to be made in response to people talking about non-parametrics. Um, I think Many? that's a great topic for a working group, by the way. I think there's a lot of interest in that, and it seems uh, so, so first, I want to rise to the, to the comment that uh, we need to do this because if we don't, someone else will, uh, which is to say that would you apply that same argument to funding for improving the design of perpetual motion machines or to predicting exactly what the weather is going to be six months from today or Saturday? For, for Saturdays, there's a really big market in knowing exactly what the weather is going to be, uh, and I don't, I don't think we would. Uh, but, but my question is, is about extreme event analysis, and it doesn't hinge on the Bayesian, non-Bayesian. So this is, a, this is a true case. We have two extreme event analyses done for locations that are 200 meters apart. And, and one is for 40 years into the future for a decommissioning study. And the other one is for 100 years into the future for a new build. Two separate groups were, were, were hired, and the most extreme event expected in the next 40 years was significantly more extreme than the one expected in the next 100 years. So this, of course, doesn't really make sense. <laughs> so how do you talk to the regulator about you know, what you should design for? And so in this case, both estimates were valid and independently reproduced by other groups. The things was that they were conditioned on slightly different background information. So one group tried to marry the physics and the statistics to some extent, and the other one may have fallen into one of Michael's traps of they did the right maths. <laughs> Uh, but it's still a, you know, th th this, is, this is a tens of millions of currency units, dollars, pounds, euros, and it, and it causes, they, d they, d they really don't really know how to respond to this, and they, they need to come up with, with a synthesis, not really averaging them, but I'm, so I'm just curious, so it's only, I don't know if it counts as two-dimensional, maybe it's not high, but, but, but how do you, when, when people are really trying to use these analyses and you get two very valid analyses give you rather different results, is, is there any way forward to deciding, to, to saying something about what's going on? What do you think? Yeah, what do you guys? Oh, gosh. What do you guys? Um, <laughs> well, but doesn't that suggest that the, the uncertainties are being underestimated? I mean, unless, unless one of these analyses was clearly wrong and the other much better, if they were just different and give very different answers, isn't that a sign that we're, we're underestimating uncertainties? by conditioning on too many things when we fit our models. So in that case, what you would want to say is that the, the actual value of the extreme, that there should have been a better range of the uncertainty in what the extreme yes. would have been, and that maybe they would, yeah, I think that's a reasonable. Well, and, and from your description, it sounded like they started from a different set of assumptions, and the uncertainties on those assumptions, I would guess, those are even harder to, to quantify than, after, than what comes out at the end. So I, I, I would suspect that, that part of the cause was that, and I think that my best uh, answer on the spot would be, well, let's, let's look at these factors and investigate it more, but of course that's what researchers say. <laughs> 
so, uh, so the discussion that's going on around here suggests to me that there might be a possibility for maybe model selection on extremes. I mean, just from a purely statistical point of view, a choice of thresholds for POT models or uh, how many order statistics you use, is that something that you think is relevant for this working group? Um, so, so the work I'm doing with Brian, we're just trying to run simulations that are automated and we couldn't really even find any clear, kind of even vague consensus as to how, how one should pick thresholds. It's more like you look at a few pictures and pick one or you pick, you always pick the 95th quantile because that's what everybody always picks. So it's either, it's either some number that's made up or you look at a picture. I mean, the, the actual, you actually wanted a, an automated way of picking the threshold. People have tried doing it, but I don't think anybody has, you know, maybe, maybe you, you do have a good way of doing it. But that's even in the IID case. Let's forget the real case we're working on here. We have seasonality and dependence and Richard and I have an unpublished paper where you where you look at this with uh, the AIC. Uh, that, that's that's a crude way of doing it. I mean, there, there there is a literature on automated methods of selecting the threshold, and infinite numbers of results that prove asymptotic efficiency under certain you know different types of asymptotic conditions, but. Are those results practicable in finite sample sizes? I mean, I, I have my opinion and other people may have theirs. I mean, there's a literature out there, you can look at it. If it answers the questions you're really trying to answer, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that could be a legitimate question for the group to look at. These, are, these uh, questions that are being asked are being asked in the extremes community and have been being asked in the extremes community in the 10 or 15 years that I've been in it. Um, and they don't have easy answers. Uh, the, um, there's recent work by Philippe Niveau where he talks about this idea of having something flexible below the threshold and something semi-parametric or kind of moving toward parametric as you get further and further in the tail. Uh, I've done some work where, I've done a couple of projects where we've done similar things. And I'd say that these are, so your question was, are these great things to look at? And the answer is yes. Um, there, people have been looking at them and they haven't come up with a slam dunk answer and that's something that the working group should be aware of moving, if they want to move that direction. There was a question in the front behind you, Richard. Oh, sorry. Uh, Shadow. Uh, um, uh, so I wanted to uh, pose a different question uh, so I'm in, interested in abrupt climate change, and sometimes that's brought up in the in the context of extremes. Uh, so the um, in 2013, the National uh, Research Council published the report, uh, giving a suggestion that uh, the science community uh, target the potential for different systems to undergo uh, rapid, uh, you know, significant uh, like regime change type of uh, behavior. And uh, that we know from the paleoclimate record that uh, the climate system supports such behavior, but that we don't really know enough about biological systems and tropical dynamics uh, that, that uh, we maybe in the next hundred years, we don't expect too much from the overturning circulation in the, in the ocean. But there's so much uh, about the climate system that we uh, don't, uh, haven't fully explored. So I guess the question I would have is, um, whether there are uh, strategies that you you could um, that for systems that have uh, behavior that is suggestive or predictive of, of it having this potential for th threshold behavior or uh, uh, like another uh, regime, uh, whether you could actually uh, anticipate that or know like how do you focus where you're if these are things that you don't actually have observations for. Where would you look uh, for these kinds of vul uh, vulnerabilities? I'm sorry. And, and do you mean beyond some of the metrics that are proposed, like looking at variations and variances of some key indices or autocorrelation timescales of various indices as you approach a 
a bifurcation point, things get more variable and slow down? Yeah, so I think dynamic systems. I think dynamic systems theory obviously have uh, some of these uh, predictions, but so. Th like my concern is that if you have time to look for that, like you're, it's too late. Uh, so like the ocean might have something like that, and you might be able to see the fluctuations occurring, you know, months or years in advance or something. But if it's in the atmosphere, you're talking uh, a month. Well, there have been some recent studies that have suggested, for example, in transitions in the nocturnal boundary layer between different um, regimes of stratification that uh, it's, it's the, the sort of typical horizontal length scale fluctuations starts to change around the point of a transition. And so um, that would be something you didn't necessarily need a lot of, of lead time to see if you if you had a good reason to believe that was something that was actually changing. But you know, it's, it's a very specific problem. It's a very specific phenomenon. And it's a very recent study. I don't think it's been necessarily reproduced in other contexts. So uh, there may be some kinds of measures like that, but again, you know, there are there are fundamental statistical questions there about how you how you try to estimate these things in a in a, in a way that your the, the the uncertainties in your estimates are not swamping your uh, early warning signal. I wanted to go back to. Um, is this working? Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to go back to. Um, uh, Lenny's um, example of the uh, 40 years and 100 years, and, and and I guess I wanted to ask the panel if if it's um, if there's been much progress made on on, on modeling the uh, return level um, also as a function of dur duration. So you have a choice of what um, what periods to look at, and then the extremes within a given period and. Um, it's it, it it's it seems like that that's a a, a much more um, uh, a, 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 a much more sophisticated way of say looking at the model output than just a single time. What the panel thought of that. So it depends what what you're interested in. If as Michael said, um, the. Uh, Fitted distributions, extreme value distributions for temperature and precipitation are often quite different in the, uh, in the, in the shape of their tail. About temperature distributions are usually bounded, which means the difference between one long period return value and you know, something twice is not all that great. Um, on the other hand, the difference between return period for slightly different return values might be very different of the shape of the distribution. But all bets are off for um, heavy-tailed precipitation distribution, which, which actually this bothers me, has always bothered me, is, you know, when you have the, uh, the unbounded distribution of the infinite period, turn value for precipitation is infinity. And of course, you know, Ken has worked a lot on on this idea of probable maximum precipitation. So this may be some way to get the physics back into the distribution. We can estimate from some uh, unstatistical, some mechanistic um, arguments of what the maximum precipitation should be. How can we incorporate that into our statistical model? I don't know the Is it whether that. those bounds are useful or not? Right, I mean, so temperature has a lower bound to it real lower bound to it. It's just not a useful one for surface temperatures, right? And so for precipitation, the issue would, I mean, I, I think there was some event, like in the Guinness Book of World Records, where in one place it rained like five inches in a minute or something absurd like that. In India, in India, it, ran, it, it, it did like two meters a day once. Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, uh, but that's presumably not a reasonable limit for most places. Well, Ken, Ken can you comment on, on what the utility of upper bound on precipitation actually is. Well, to the extent that means anything, um, I mean, practical importance is this, this kind of uh, concept, and maybe it should be called a concept, uh, is used all the time in dam spillway design. We just absolutely cannot 
countenance failure of the system. So you have to have some estimate of, of, of what you're going to design to. And these values they design to are really, if, you, if you've never seen them, are surprisingly large. And they're expensive to design to. So, um, and, and the methods they use to determine that are kind of semi-scientific, semi-statistical, but uh, might be called more rational where you're trying to just estimate from one's knowledge of meteorology what the likely limits are. Uh, it's not a well-posed problem, and in fact, it would be useful if someone could come up with uh, methods that were more well-posed. Um, and you get into, I mean, I'm thinking about extreme precipitation in general, and what does, just take anything you might model, let's say daily uh, precipitation or something like that, or maybe um, in terms of return levels and durations, so there's a variety of things. In practice, those are composed often of multiple events. And it kind of gets to maybe a, a nuance on the multivariate idea. It's not multivariate in variable space, but it is in the event space, where the key thing is how are these events um, sequenced? And you can take maybe, uh, I guess an example would be maybe some of the flooding in California, like Orville Dam. Was that a single event? No, it occurred because of a sequence of events. So how do you model probability of that? Um, you know, maybe you just, I guess what's really done is you just kind of sum it all together. But in practice, the physics is all kind of, um, uh, what, just put into a big pot and you, and you, you know, get what you get. But the physics has been, been subsumed into, uh, I, I, I guess from the standpoint of modeling, it would be helpful in, the, in this dam safety maximum precipitation thing. Can we model this sort of sequential nature? I would put it out to the working group that we do actually have good data here. Um, the forecasters would say um, in this situation, this, this, the storm door is open, and you get three or four atmospheric rivers coming in, each one of which is a big storm. You know, the first one doesn't do much, fills the reservoirs. Second storm's worse, and the third one, everything is saturated, and you get mudslides and, and you know, uh, the risk of dam overflows. In this case. So there is good data for that. That, that um, is surprisingly long. Back to the, the beginning of the 20th century. So that that's a data set that I can get our hands on. If, uh, Time for maybe one more question. Okay. Well, it's perfectly at two o'clock. So thanks everybody for their great discussion. Uh, we're staying here. We're going to start the section on statistics, uh, climate and health. Uh, the chair is going to be Elizabeth Manhart from EPA.